be talking about the mitotic spindle, uh, microtubules again, but this time in another configuration. So this is the mitotic spindle, and this is a movie of mitosis in a human cell. So this is something that is happening in our bodies all the time. You see a spindle here in white, the microtubules are labeled in white, and the chromosomes in red. And this process of mitosis, of the division, cell division, the division of the genetic material, this is, to me, the most fascinating process in the whole living world. Uh, first of all, it's very fundamental. There would be no life without cell division, obviously. And if you look at the dynamics of this process, this is so fascinating because um, here it starts. Now, the spindle forms, and it looks very messy in the beginning. The chromosomes are all over the place. The microtubules are trying to capture these chromosomes. And then, in the end, everything is very nice and precise, and the chromosomes gets divided, get divided into two equal uh, sets. So how this exactly works, we still don't know in spite of a lot of work of many, many labs. And the reason is that this is just so complex. More than 300 different types of proteins contribute to this uh, uh, drive, this process. And uh, they have very complex interactions, so this is something that we are, um, that uh, the field is actively studying. And, okay, so what the spindle has to do is, of course, it has to accurately segregate the chromosomes into two equal parts. And this is very important because uh, if the spindle segregates the chromosomes really correctly, like in, in this example, so we have one set of chromosomes here, one here, then the daughters of this cell will have a normal karyotype. The karyotype is just a set of chromosomes in our cells. So this is how our chromosomes should look. We should have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and each of them should be exactly in two copies. And if this process doesn't go uh, in a correct manner, so if you have a missegregation of a chromosome, for example, this one here is going to end up somewhere, possibly in the wrong set of uh, the chromosomes. And if these kind of errors in division in the spindle happen over and over again, then we can get this, what is called an aneuploid karyotype, which means that the number of chromosomes is not correct. And you see here, this is an example from a patient, from a real person, from a patient of a col colorectal cancer. And you see that chromosome one is present, for example, in three copies and so on. The chromosomes are not anymore in two copies. So this is why why it's also important to understand the spindle. Uh, for us, uh, it's super interesting to understand the spindle because we just want to understand how this beautiful structure is functioning, but also it's very relevant uh, for uh, medical reasons. If we understand better how the spindle works and when and why these kind of errors occur, then maybe we will be able to design some strategies to prevent these kind of things in diseases such as cancer and also during human uh, development. So here is now a brief introduction into the spindle. What you need to know about the spindle for this talk is that the spindle is made of microtubules. We have two centrosomes. One is here, one is here. I will also call them spindle poles. Spindle pole is the region around the centrosome. And then there are different classes of microtubules. Uh, they are all made of tubulin, but uh, the, the, these different classes mean that they, are, they have different function and location inside the spindle. And two of them will be important today. One is the kinetochore microtubules. They grow from the spindle pole region, more or less, to the kinetochore. The kinetochore is this point here on the chromosome. This is the point where uh, the attachment point of microtubules to the chromosome. And we also have these overlap microtubules. They are coming from one and the other side. They are anti-parallel. They overlap in the middle. And uh, motor proteins and many other proteins accumulate here and do interesting things, which we will see later. So microtubules are uh, tubes of the protein tubulin. They grow and shrink, as we have seen just from Joe's talk. And motor proteins walk uh, along them, which, is, uh, which will be very important. And the kinetochores are these protein complexes of uh, many, several tens of proteins uh, here at the centromere of each chromosome. And microtubules are attached end on to these points. And then uh, these microtubules exert forces on the chromosomes. They can generate these kind of oscillations of the chromosome. And then eventually they uh, segregate uh, the, the two chromatids of the chromosome. And today I will focus on three questions. So first, I will tell you something about how chromosome location affects what will happen to the chromosome during division. This will be like a 
introduction to tell you that there is something interesting happening with the polar chromosomes, and polar chromosomes are those behind the pole. And then I will focus on these two questions and show you new mechanisms that, that we proposed for, first of all, how these polar chromosomes reach the spindle from here to here, and then how they find the spindle midplane, because all the chromosomes need to be nicely arranged at the midplane before they uh, segregate. And the first part is collaboration with the lab of Herd Cops, and the last part is collaboration with uh, Nenad Pavin, who is giving the next talk. Um, so let's start with the first part. So chromosomes have different location within the nucleus, because the nucleus is full of chromosomes, and the, when the spindle is forming, there are these two spindle poles, and then the chromosomes can be found anywhere in relation to these uh, spindle poles, and then this determines how they will move towards the spindle and on the spindle. And the most curious case is this case of these polar chromosomes, so they are, uh, by the definition, they are behind the spindle pole. And it's, it's interesting how they, uh, how they are able to, to reach the spindle and whether this kind of, uh, their location behind the pole, which uh, looks like some unfavorable location, does this really matter um, uh, for what will happen to them during, during cell age? So to study this, we decided to look at all the chromosomes. That's always kind of our first approach. Uh, I love microscopy. Microscopy is so nice because you can just see what things in the cells are doing, then you get some idea, and then you can <laughs> think more of what is really happening there. So here we took a human cell in which uh, all the kinetochores are labeled. So each of these dots, they are kinetochores on the chromosome. And you can see that they are kind of exist in pairs. So they are pairs of sister kinetochores on the sister chromatids on, on, the, on one chromosome. These dots that are here at the edges, these are the centrosomes, two centrioles in each of them. And the colors show you the depth uh, at which they, they were, so the, the Z coordinate. And this is a whole mitosis in a human cell, and we can now follow, these are, these are still images from this movie, and we can follow each a pair of sister kinetochores from where it's coming and what's going to happen to it. So for example, this one here started slightly behind this uh, right pole, and now we are following it. It's here, it's here, it's here. It is one of the last ones that arrives to the metaphase plate. This is called chromosome alignment or aligned chromosomes at the metaphase plate. So we wanted to quantify this now, whether the time of alignment depends on the position of the chromosomes within the nucleus. And we divided the chromosomes into polar ones, so the ones behind the pole. Then we have the central ones, they are between the centrosomes. And then we have the peripheral non-polar ones. So they are somewhere at the periphery, and they have roughly the same distance to, to the metaphase, future metaphase plate. Uh, so they have the same distance that they need to cover, these guys and these guys. And we see that the time of alignment depends uh, on this uh, location of the chromosomes. The polar ones have the longest time uh, of alignment. The, this time is longer than the time of the peripheral polar ones. And it's much longer than, uh, than the time uh, that the central ones need to align. This means that uh, not all chromosomes have the same time of alignment, and, uh, and importantly, that the polar ones are the last ones to get aligned, and this is not because of the distance, because these guys also need to cover a la large distance, but it's because they are behind the pole because the pole is probably some kind of obstacle that they need to uh, cross to, to be able to reach, uh, to reach the spindle. Okay, so this experiment just tells us that uh, some chromosomes arrive later to the metaphase plate than others, but this, this measurement was done in a healthy cell, and the cell has a checkpoint to check that all the chromosomes arrive at the metaphase plate and are properly attached. So these chromosomes will not uh, missegregate. They will not make any errors, even though some are earlier, some are later. So to see whether there will be uh, uh, any errors uh, depending on the location of the chromosomes, we uh, treated these cells with uh, MPS1 inhibitor. MPS1 is an important kinase that is part of the spindle assembly checkpoint and also involved in error correction. Uh, and this, uh, this kinase is sometimes um, not working properly uh, during certain uh, developmental syndrome cases. Um, 
And then you can see that errors in chromosome segregation appear. So you can see this in this cell. For example, when all the chromosomes are, uh, when most of the chromosomes are dividing properly, you can see some of them are uh, uh, left behind. And now we use these cells to study uh, whether, the, whether certain chromosomes make more errors than others. These are still images from the movie that I have shown you because it's much easier to follow the chromosomes like this. So let's start from the beginning. This is the nucleus. The chromosomes are inside the nucleus. These are the centrosomes, this and this. Now, between here and here, the nuclear envelope breaks down, and now the chromosomes are yeah, all over the place, and we are following this one that is one of the polar chromosomes, so it's behind the pole. It's here, it's here, you see it here, you see it here, now it's passing the centrosome, it's here, and at this point, anaphase starts. Now all the chromosomes are starting to segregate. You can see that the distance between sister kinetochores on all the chromosomes is increasing. And now look what happens with these, these two sisters. What they should do is one should go to this pole and the other one should go to that pole. But what happens is they don't make it. They just don't have enough time to make it. And the, the one is here, one is here. And this one here is now in this huge crowd and it just remains in this crowd. So one is here, one is here, and again here and here. So both sister uh, kinetochores ended up in the daughter cell to the right. So this will generate uh, uh, an unemployed uh, daughter cells. And now we quantify these kind of experiments. Again, we looked at our central chromosomes, peripheral nonpolar, and polar ones, and we asked what kind of mistakes do they make in anaphase when chromosomes are segregating. This can be either no error or a lagging chromosome, the one that is behind, or the unaligned chromosome, which is when both sister kinetochores stay uh, on one side, uh, which, was, which was the example I showed you on the previous slide. And we see that the central ones predominantly make no error, and on the opposite side are the polar ones, which predominantly make an error, and this error is typically of the kind of unaligned chromosome. So the whole chromosome, both parts of the chromosomes stay close to one pole and go to one cell. So this is the conclusion of the first part. We uh, found that these uh, chromosomes that are behind the pole uh, are in danger to missegregate, we call this the danger zone. So these chromosomes missegregate more frequently than other chromosomes. And this means that it's the, uh, the identity of the chromosomes is not the same between the chromosomes that missegregate and the, uh, the ones that, uh, that don't missegregate. And this comes from chromosome territories in interface. So before mitosis, the cell is in interface, and in interface, there are chromos chromosomes have their territories. So chromosomes are not randomly positioned within the nucleus. It's known that they uh, occupy certain territories. And on average, it's uh, in this way that uh, the large chromosomes, like chromosomes number one, two, three, are typically close to the nuclear envelope, and the small ones are in the center. And this means then that the large ones, which are close to the nuclear envelope, will more often be also behind the pole than the small ones in the center. So this means that during tumor evolution, tumor development, this may change, uh, this may affect how the tumor will develop, how the chromosomes in a tumor will develop, because not all chromosomes are missegregating with the same frequency, and this may affect how a certain tumor will in the end have, uh, uh, what chromosomes this tumor will have in excess, and what chromosomes will be uh, missing in a, in a certain tumor. Okay, and now let's see how these polar chromosomes in a normal healthy cell pass around the centrosome because they have to come from here to the mid uh, to the mid plane of the spindle we um, thought of three possible models how this can be done this has not been studied before so these are the models that we could <laughs> envision so the first model is that there could be motor proteins. It's known that there are motor proteins on the kinetochore. In particular, there is SMP, it's a, from a kinesin 7 family, and dynein. These two motors exist on the kinetochore. That's known. But we thought maybe these motors can somehow um, um, link this kinetochore, which is on the back side of the pole, to the, to the microtubules of the spindle and bring it to the, to the main body of the spindle. The second model is that the microtubules growing from somewhere on the opposite side of the spindle can come to the kinetochores here, grab them, and pull them to the other side. 
And the last model is that we know that the spindle is elongating at this time, so maybe the spindle elongation could uh, help the chromosome to, uh, to uh, move from the behind the pole to the, to the place in front of the pole. Eva? Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility of pivoting of the astral microtubule? I mean, the microtubule attached to the polar chromosome? Is there a, a pivoting what? possible? A pivot? <laughs> it will. Uh <laughs> It will be there, and it's a part of uh, it's a part of this uh, uh, model number three. So um, yeah, but let's quickly just look at the model model number one and two. So model number one, we have these two motors that are etokinetochore, SMP and dynein. We depleted them and looked uh, in our movies what is happening. Um, so without SMP, the kinetochores that are behind the pole, they more or less normally move to the region uh, in front of the pole. This cell is not completely normal because MP has a function to move the, uh, in the moving of the uh, kinetochores from the pole towards the midplane, but at least the, uh, this mechanism of, of um, uh, moving the chromosomes from behind the pole to the front of the pole does not depend on SMP. Similarly, dynein, we depleted spindly, which is a kinetochore adapter of dynein, and uh, again, we see that the kinetochores uh, coming from the back of the pole arrive at the position somewhere in front of the pole. So this movement of the, of the chromosome from here to here does not depend on these two motors. So there goes model one. Now, model two was that the, that the uh, microtubules from the opposite side uh, reach the kinetochore and pull it towards the opposite side. This is a super resolution stead uh, image of a spindle at a very, very early stage of um, assembly. Here is one pole, here is the other pole, and we have a lot of uh, kinetochores behind this pole and behind this pole. And if we look at these polar kinetochores, we don't actually see microtubules from the other side um, attaching to them. All the kinetochores are attached to some microtubules. We don't see any kinetochore that is free from microtubules because there are just so many microtubules and kinetochores are sticky, full of proteins that bind to microtubules. So all the kinetochores are bound to microtubules, but they are in 90% of cases bound only to the microtubules uh, uh, coming from the closer pole. So this model is not... Uh, the, uh, it does not seem to be relevant. Maybe in a certain cases it can work, but this is not, this cannot explain the typical behavior of the chromosome. So we are now at the model three, which says that the spindle elongation uh, is helping the chromosomes to, to move from the back to the front. And um, as Weish now mentioned, this, um, if the, um, if the chromosome is uh, attached to the microtubule all the time and the spindle is elongating, then there will be some pivoting of the microtubules around the spindle pole, and I will now explain this, uh, what we see here. So, to see whether there is any movement of the, of the microtubules or, or um, uh, together with the chromosome, we did this kind of imaging. In this image, you can see EB3 spots. These are these white spots, and these are tips of growing microtubules. These kind of movies are typically called fireworks movies. This is the centrosome. The spindle pole is here, and you see these guys growing out and moving out. These are tips of growing microtubules. And now the spindle, the whole spindle would be somewhere here. We are looking at this region behind the left pole. And especially we want to focus on these two sister kinetochores, these two uh, blue dots. You see here that these white things are shooting past these, these uh, uh, blue dots. So this means there is, a, there is a bundle of microtubules next to them to which they are attached. And, uh, and it's uh, doing something interesting, which again is easier to see from still images from a movie. So the centrosome is here, our kinetochores are here, and you see this line, this is a microtubule bundle to which these kinetochores are attached. And 30 seconds later, this microtubule bundle is here, 48 seconds, it's here. If you superimpose these three traces of the microtubule contour, you see that it's going in this direction. So the microtubule is pivoting. This is what we mean by pivoting. If my elbow is the centrosome, then the microtubule is doing like this. So what is pivoting and 
what drives pivoting and uh, what is it good for and so on. So pivoting of microtubules um, is something very interesting that we first saw, it's now 10 years ago, in yeast. So this is a yeast cell. Here would be a cell. This is the mitotic spindle in yeast. It's very small. Uh, it's about two or three microns. And it's just one single bundle of microtubules. So this is a spindle. And then you see these microtubules here. These are also these are bundles of a few microtubules. And you can see that these microtubules are undergoing this motion. They're pivoting around the, uh, around the spindle pole. And this uh, pink spot is a kinetochore. And our idea was that, that uh, this pivoting motion helps the microtubules to uh, search and, and uh, grab the kinetochore, something like this. They are doing the pivoting, and then eventually they, they grab the kinetochore. We also uh, later uh, showed that this pivoting is important to assemble the spindle in yeast. So this is one spindle pole. This is the under spindle, spindle pole. And the move is looping. And you see how, by this kind of motion, the spindle is being formed. And, uh, uh, others have done a lot of uh, genetic work on, this, uh, on these systems to show which, which proteins are responsible for, for this special link between the microtubule and the spindle pole, so that this link is strong enough to hold the microtubule there, but it's allowing for this rotational or lateral uh, movement. And we made the model. So this is the model developed by uh, Nenad Pavin. Uh, it's a very simple model. The idea was that simply this microtubule is pivoting, and uh, we are asking what is the fraction of lost kinetochores over time. So this is a question of a first passage time. Uh, there are no free parameters. We, uh, all the geometrical uh, parameters of the system are uh, in the model, and then the model gives a direct prediction how does this fraction of lost kinetochore over time, uh, how, does, how does it change as, the kineto as more and more kinetochores are being uh, captured. And this is, uh, this is our experimental data. So we have a quite, uh, quite uh, beautiful agreement with this simple model, which is not a fit, but a direct prediction of the model based on the measured movement of the microtubule, movement of the kinetochore, and the geometry of the system. And the point is that this model, with pivoting of the microtubules included, says that half of the kinetochores will be captured in about three minutes. And the prevailing model in the field before we developed this model was a basic search and capture model uh, developed by Michison and Kirchner, which, was, uh, which is based on simply microtubule growth and shrinkage, the dynamic instability that we just heard from Joe, without this lateral movement. And without the lateral movement, it would take about 100 minutes to capture the kinetochores. And with this pivoting movement, this rotational movement, it takes only three uh, minutes, as in the experiment. So um, this showed that the microtubule pivoting in yeast is very important to capture the kinetochores. But what about pivoting in human uh, spindles? Mm -hmm. This is because. Uh, this is because some cells are entering anaphase at that point, uh, so the geometry is changing. The spindle poles are, uh, um, in the experiment, the cells are entering anaphase, the spindle poles are separating, so the geometry is changing. While in the model, we keep always the same geometry, uh, which is completely relevant for the first, uh, for the beginning times, but after seven, eight minutes, uh, uh, the, the geometry uh, is not the same anymore. I'm not sure if I missed it, but does the pivoting occur as a physical process that is because of the geometry and just the spindle, like an extra weight of uh, the kinetochore being, being attached to the spindle, or is it a more biochemical? Uh, great question. It's, uh, it's purely, uh, uh, it's uh, thermally driven. In yeast, it's thermally driven. It does not depend on uh, ATP. Uh, it's just thermally driven, so it's just diffusive motion uh, as normal diffusion, but it's just a diffusive motion over rod, uh, which has the, uh, the hinge point. Yeah. So related to this question, is the, pi is the pivoting dynamics related to the persistent length of the microtubule, which is millimeters, which is large? So if you could increase the persistent length, modify the persistent length, maybe you could 
tune a little bit this capturing, search and capturing dynamics. Is that uh, correct? Um, partly, I think, yes. Uh, these microtubules are very short. So in this case, this is far below the persistence length. These microtubules are two micrometers long. So they are super short. Uh, this means that they are, uh, uh, that they are stiff. Okay. And uh, for this geometry, we are far from, from anywhere near the persistence length. But it's super related to the human cells in which we are getting closer to the persi persistence length. And then the microtubules are not so stiff anymore and are not just doing this, but they're doing uh, other stuff. OK, thank you. You said, uh, you know, so these are small, much smaller microtubules. So if you, if you come to the, if you go to the limit of larger microtubules, you, are you saying that pivoting can just happen due to the polymer motion or that's, uh, you, you still need this kind of phenomenology there? So um, we don't see this kind of pivoting when the microtubules are big. Because first of all, they're too big to, to have only this thermal diffusive motion. Then also the persistence length and everything comes into place, so they're also bending a bit. And then, of course, there are all other, uh, other microtubules and other things in the cell that are capturing them, so they're not alone anymore uh, uh, to just do this, but they are interacting also with other structures. And basically, we don't understand what's going on in human cells uh, exactly. We understand understand here very well, we can explain uh, the behavior of these cells by this simple pivoting like this. And in human cells, it's much more complex. We don't know yet what's happening there. But I will show uh, some movies, so maybe you'll see something. OK, so human cells. Um, very little is known about pivoting in human cells. And some ideas that we got that pivoting may occur around the centrosomes come from these kind of experiments. So this is a beautiful experiment by Sophie Dumont's lab in which they did a really amazing thing. This is a micro needle. So they, they put a micro needle on top of the cell. They didn't pierce the cell, but just make an indentation here. And then they pulled the micro needle in this direction. And then they got this. This is really amazing. But, and this tells us that you can, uh, if you exert a force in this direction, you're not going to, uh, to pull uh, the microtubule out of the centrosome, but it's going to pivot because it pivoted. It, it, was, it had the angle uh, with respect to, let's say, the spindle axis like this, and now it has this angle. So it's able to pivot under force. Then also some experiments that we were doing for other uh, purposes um, tell us that microtubules can pivot uh, around the spindle pole. So this is a normal spindle. And then we compress this spindle from above. And uh, the spindle gets more flat. And also, this angle here increases. So the angle was like this. Now it's a bigger angle. So these, at least these outer microtubules obviously pivoted towards the uh, outwards. And the same th happens if you, if you take a normal spindle, a nice spindle, and then you put it uh, on cold temperature, then all these unstable and unbound microtubules depolymerize, and the spindle ends up looking like this. And during this uh, shrinkage of many microtubules and shrinking of the whole spindle, you also see that, the, that these outer microtubules somehow pivoted outwards. So this tells us that pivoting is possible, um, but... Yeah, we don't know uh, whether it's happening in, in this system and uh, what drives it. Anyway, so we wanted to study this pivoting for our polar chromosomes. So we have a polar chromosome here. And uh, to study pivoting, we are measuring the angle between the, this microtubule here and the spindle axis. And the angle over time goes down as the chromosome is moving from here to here. Um, typical angle is 140, 120 degrees, whatever, and it ends up at around 50 when it, when it kind of uh, um, uh, binds here to the spindle. And at the same time, spindle length is increasing. So this was our hypothesis. This is the basis of the, of the model number three, that as the spindle is elongating, the angle uh, is decreasing. And this means there is a very clear prediction from this, that if we would reverse the spindle elongation, if we would make the spindle shorten, then the pivoting should occur in the opposite direction. 
And this is what we wanted to do here. So first, imagine a normal spindle. In an untreated cell, the spindle will elongate and the chromosome will move from here to here. Here we uh, wanted to use uh, a drug called STLC. This is inhibitor of egg 5 which is the protein that makes the spindle grow. Basically, when you do this, you get a spindle shortening. And there is another kind of inhibitor of uh, the same protein egg 5 called FCPT. This is a rigor binding, so if you do this inhibitor, then you block spindle growth and any growth of anything uh, um, uh, related to, to this. And now here are the results. So the spindle length, as we know, in untreated cell increases, the spindle grows. When we used STLC, as expected, the spindle length goes down. And when we use FCPT, the spindle length does not change. And here is the angle. This is, remember, this is the angle that we are measuring. In untreated cells, as I have shown you, the angle goes down. And here is our prediction in STLC uh, uh, treated cells. When the spindle length goes down, the angle goes up. So indeed, by reversing the spindle elongation, we can get reversing of the pivoting towards uh, the outer side. And uh, when everything is blocked, also the angle is blocked. So this is our current model. Um, we think that it's uh, the, the spindle elongation is driving microtubule pivoting. So the spindle is elongating, the centrosomes are moving apart. The chromosome is remaining more or less on the same location with respect to the cell in the, in the coordinate system of the cell. It's bound to the microtubule. The spindle elongation is driving the pivoting of this microtubule. And in the end, the chromosome ends up from the uh, back side of the pole to the front side of the pole and attaches to the microtubules here. OK, and now the last part of my talk is about once we have our chromosome here, how does it uh, get to the metaphase plate? So um, a lot is already known about this, and there are several mechanisms how the cell is doing this. And the main one is related to kinesin 8, which uh, here Joe uh, did some really uh, uh, pioneering work uh, some time ago uh, showing how kinesin 8 can measure microtubule length because it accumulates on, uh, uh, on microtubules in, uh, in de uh, dependent on the microtubule length. So the longer microtubule accumulates more motors. They are highly processive, which means that they walk for a long distance without detaching, and they accumulate at the plus end. So the longer microtubule will accumulate more kinesin 8 at the plus end than the short one. And now uh, we know that kinesin 8 suppresses uh, microtubule growth. In certain systems, it increases microtubule depolymerization, or it can induce microtubule pausing, or it can induce catastrophe. But overall, uh, we can say that kinesin 8 suppresses microtubule growth. And then the growth of the long microtubule will be suppressed more than the growth of the short one. And this will overall then lead to the growth of this one and shrinkage of this one, and the chromosome will move to the center. So this is, uh, this is one uh, mechanism of how the cell is able to center the chromosome. But this is not the whole story, because the, the, micro, the chromosome is not attached only to micro, one microtubule on one side but one, and one microtubule on the other side. But there are also other microtubules in the vicinity for which we thought uh, that they uh, must exert some force on the chromosome and, and uh, influence its, uh, uh, its behavior. So we called this, uh, these microtubules bridging microtubules, because here you see one kinetochore fiber, the other kinetochore fiber. Kinetochores would be here. And there is this microtubule here that uh, we call the bridging fiber because it looks like a bridge between, uh, between sister kinetochore fibers. And to make it simple, this is highly oversimplified, but just to make the point, the old picture was that uh, chromosomes are bound only to kinetochore microtubules, and these overlap microtubules are somewhere far away. And our picture was that, that uh, uh, these overlap microtubules are not somewhere else, but they are tightly bound to kinetochore microtubules, and they make some mechanical unit here and probably generate force, which we then wanted to explore. But then, this is even not the whole story, which you uh, uh, have to 
think of if you are thinking of how chromosomes get centered. There is something really uh, amazing going on in the spindle, which has been known uh, for a long time, uh, uh, and this is microtubule poloid flux. So if you label microtubules here, here, which we did here by photoactivation, somewhere here, this spot of photoactivatable, uh, photoactivated uh, GFP tubulin moves towards the pole. So all the microtubules in the spindle are constantly moving towards the pole, being disassembled at the pole, and assembled again somewhere in the central region of the spindle. And this is something also that uh, has to be taken into account if you want to know how chromosomes get centered, if everything is also moving forward. And now, this is the model that Nenad proposed. And here I want to emphasize how beautiful it is for me as a biologist to collaborate with a theoretical physicist. We have been collaborating for more than 15 years now. And the nicest thing is when theory, uh, theoretical physics, predicts something that uh, for biology, not just explains the biological experiment, but predicts something completely new. This is, this is still very rare in biology, that, that physics predicts something that the biologist wouldn't think of. And uh, this happened several times uh, for us now, and I will show you this example. So what Nenad was saying is, if this is true, what I have shown you before, that there is polar flux and there is this bridging fiber and so on, then it must work like this, because this is, this is based on basic principles of geometry of the system and properties of microtubules and motor proteins. And, he made this kind of model, so very simple. We have two kinetochores connected by an elastic spring, which is the chromatin. We have kinetochore microtubules, one going here and one going here. This is the simplest possible model. There's only one microtubule. And now the, the new thing in this model compared to previous models is the bridging microtubules, the blue ones. One is coming from here and one is coming from here. The white guys here are motor proteins. Uh, you can think of them as egg 5 or some, the, the, the name doesn't matter. These are motor proteins that bind to anti-parallel microtubules, and they slide the microtubules apart. And what is new in our model compared to anything that, uh, any similar models from before, is that uh, the, these motors are not only in the overlaps of anti-parallel microtubules like these blue ones, but they are also in the anti-parallel overlaps between the kinetochore microtubule and the non-kinetochore microtubule, some other microtubule, which in our case is the bridging microtubule. So any anti-parallel overlap, you will get these motors. And these motors slide microtubules apart. Uh, and now this model gives two very interesting predictions, which are uh, shown here. So the first one is that the bridging microtubules flux at a faster rate than the kinetochore microtubules. And the second one, most important one, is that the flux of the longer kinetochore microtubule is faster than the polar flux of the shorter one. The reason for this is that the longer, micro, the longer kinetochore fiber has a longer overlap with the bridging microtubules, has more motors there, and the force will be higher. And the consequence of this is that the chromosome will go to the center, because the longer one will pull it more than the short one. So this is uh, what Nenad said, and <laughs> so this means that the longer kinetochore fiber has to flux at a faster rate than the shorter one. I said there is no way. People have been measuring this since 1989. There were Tens of labs who measured polar flux. Somebody would have seen this if this is uh, really so. Um, but then, yeah, he was uh, very persuasive. So in the end, we wanted, to, we wanted to test this model, and now you will see uh, what happens. So the first test that we did is we wanted to see, first of all, whether the bridging microtubules are important at all for this centering, because this was a very new idea, because the whole, uh, all the centering mechanisms proposed before this was that everything is only done by the red microtubules. So first, let's see what are the blue microtubules doing. And to test this, we wanted to use optogenetics to acutely remove these microtubules. And we know that they are bound together by the protein called PRC1. We bound this protein to red fluorescence protein to see where it is, and this to SSPB, which is a bacterial protein which binds to the peptide SSRA, which is bind to the LAV2 domain, and this domain is uh, sensitive to light, and all of this is in the membrane. So the idea is when you shine blue light, 
the LAV2 domain will change its conformation so that this one can now bind to this one. And as our protein is undergoing turnover, binding, unbinding, diffusing, eventually it should be sequestered to the membrane. And now I will show you the movie. After a lot of optimization, in the end it worked. Um, this is the cell. Here would be the cell membrane. This is the spindle. The protein that we want to remove, PRC1, in white is here, and the kinetochores are in blue. And now, when I, when I start the movie, the light will be switched on, and you see how the white protein moves from the spindle region to the edge of the cell. And now we switch the light off, and it moves back. So this is the beauty, the beauty of these optogenetic experiments, that you can acutely remove a protein from a normally formed spindle somewhere else in the cell, and it's also reversible and fast. So this worked nicely, and then we asked uh, what is happening to our kinetochores. In the dark, the kinetochores are nicely aligned, and in the light, when PRC1 is gone and bridging microtubules are disassembled, then uh, uh, the kinetochores are not aligned anymore. So this means that the bridging microtubule is indeed important uh, for the centering. And now comes the key experiment. Is the longer kinetochore fiber fluxing faster than the short one? To, to answer this question, we have to develop a completely new method to see individual microtubules. And we did this by, by developing this speckle microscopy in which each white spot is a spot on a single microtubule in the spindle. And by measuring the movement of these spots, we measure uh, what individual microtubules are doing. And we say that it, if the white spot goes like this, this is a spot within the bridging fiber. And if the white spot behaves like this, then this is a spot uh, on the kinetochore fiber. And now we can test this important prediction that uh, the long kinetochore fiber will flux faster than the short one. And these are the experimental data. Um, indeed, which I really didn't believe for a long time, we saw that the kinetochore fiber, uh, if you have longer kinetochore fibers, the flux will be faster than the flux of the short kinetochore fibers. So this is the signature of this uh, centering mechanism by differential flux uh, on the long and the short side. Um, one, uh, this is I think the last slide I have about uh, of, of the data. So. Um, so the model predicts that the distance from the equator, so uh, how, how well or how badly the kinetochores will be centered, depends on the ratio between the flux of the kinetochore fiber and the bridging fiber. And we tested this by using a set of uh, experiments in which we depleted different spindle proteins. And we see that these points lie quite nicely uh, uh, close to the theoretical prediction which means that for the cell to have the chromosomes better centered, it's important to have a small ratio between the kinetochore fiber flux and the bridging fiber flux, uh, meaning that they flux at a different rate, which allows for slipping of the kinetochore fiber along the bridging fiber. So the bridging fiber flux is fast, the long kinetochore fiber flux is also reasonably fast, and the short kinetochore fiber flux is only a little bit, and this moves the chromosome to the cell center. So this is a new concept, this is alignment of length-dependent pooling forces. Pooling forces that are generated along the length of the microtubule uh, that pull the chromosome to the center. And this brings me to the final summary. So I have shown you that there is this danger zone in the cell behind the spindle pole, uh, and the chromosomes that are there in the beginning, they will uh, have a higher chance to missegregate at the end of mitosis. They uh, cross this uh, bed region around the pole by pivoting of the microtubule, which is driven by spindle elongation. And once they are on the spindle, they, uh, they uh, have this kind of geometry uh, related to the microtubules that are around them. And then the longer kinetochore fiber flux is faster than the short one and brings this chromosome towards the uh, spindle center. And at the very end, uh, I really want to uh, thank my wonderful lab, my uh, the students and postdocs uh, who, who did this work and who are really super motivated and super talented. And it's uh, uh, great fun to work with them on all this. And of course, our collaborators, so Herd Cops uh, for the first part, and then Pavin for uh, 15 years of developing uh, theory together for these kind of uh, systems. And thank you for listening. Questions? 
take questions from students first. Hi, so um, it's just a question about the process in general. Uh, does Is there a consistent correlation between the initial location of the chromosome and the final location on the centroid pla central plane? Is there a consistent correlation? You mean the location of the chromosome and its location within yes. the... Yes, there is. Uh, there is. They are, they, are, uh, they are not mixing much. So if the spindle is like this, if a chromosome is coming from this side, it's going to end up somewhere here at the mid-plane, and during segregation it's also going to be in this region. There is not much mixing across the spindle, uh, across the kind of diameter of the spindle. So this is independent of the chromosome identity, regardless of how big it is or how small it is, it's just going to follow this correlation. Uh, yes, so the small ones are typically in the center, found in the center of the nucleus. They will then typically be also in the center of the spindle. The big ones are typically on the outside, so they will reach the spindle on the outside and they will remain somewhere on the outside uh, region of the spindle during metaphase and, and during anaphase. Okay, maybe we can take more coffee, more questions over coffee. Uh, thank Eva again.